begin this evening by reading from Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 to 46. And what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, answered the son. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? Well, the first, they answered him. And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the, entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them in the same way. Last of all, he sent his son. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his, his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants, who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. And Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous to the eye. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the great crowd of people because the people held Jesus as a prophet. Our reading this evening is called The King We Needed But Never Wanted by Marshall Seagal. The road to Calvary was a road of confusion, not confidence, for those first disciples. Three times Jesus explained to those men what it meant for him to be the Messiah. It was a horrific yet hope-filled story. The murder of the promised king, and then an inexplicable, unprecedented resurrection. It was way over the short-sighted, glory-hungry heads of Peter, James, John, and the others. Their ignorance and wrong responses highlighted ungodly grooves in the human heart. Their errors weren't particular to first century fishermen either. No, there is pervasive and offensive in the church today. As we look forward to the horrors of Good Friday and the victory of Easter, we have to ask again, who do we say Jesus is? Much the same as Jesus asked the disciples in Mark 8:29. Is he the Christ on God's terms? Or is he just the all-wise, all-powerful key to something or someone else? The drama begins with that question. Who do you say I am? Peter responds, you are the Christ. And he was simultaneously very right and very wrong. The word Christ was fitting in every aspect. It was the right answer. But even though Peter's profile of the promised one was rightly named, it fell woefully flat. Jesus paints a more detailed portrait of the Christ, the job description of the most important human who has ever lived. In Mark 8.31 he says, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Now Peter, and presumably the other disciples, despised the idea of a suffering Christ. That's why he immediately gets in Jesus' face in Mark 8.32. 
Having rightly identified the Christ, he then presumed to have the perspective and the authority to correct him. Right, yet tragically wrong. The only Savior who truly saves, only saves through suffering. The cross was the only means of making us sinners right before a holy God. Our salvation was purchased with suffering, and it will be sealed and preserved with suffering, not comfort. We are promised comfort in the Christ Christian life, true, but not the cheap, cheap temporal imitation we've grown accustomed to in our modern world. If we come to the Crucified One expecting Him to make life easier and more comfortable, we're not listening to Him. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Again, Jesus tells them the story of Calvary before it happens in Mark 9. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed after three days, he will rise. Many of Jesus' followers thought Jesus came to rescue and reign now. They anticipated a physical and political freedom from the oppressive Roman rule. For them, the Christ was the key to their immediate this world issues. Life now, freedom now, power now. But Jesus, walking to the cross, instead says to wait, be patient. The reward of following Jesus, of finding life in Jesus, won't come in full today. But they will far surpass anything else we could have ever hoped for. In this story of life and hope and freedom, death comes first, and then life. Darkness, then liberating. Untouchable, unsearchable light. A third time, Jesus prepares them and us for his death. In Mark chapter 10, Taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. The disciples certainly imagined there would be opposition in Jerusalem, but not like this. They expected a hostile takeover, and that did happen, but they expected Rome would be, would be the bruised one, not the king. They were happy to have an opposed king, but not a rejected one. Certainly not one who was betrayed and tortured and executed. Jesus, not, Jesus did not come to purchase the approval of others, no. He was despised and rejected by man. A man of sorrows acquired or much acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, according to Isaiah 53, 3. Why? Because it is God's approval we desperately need. And God's approval doesn't come by popular opinion, but by divine intervention. The substitution of his own son in our place. We were saved through rejection, rejection, and by God's grace we will be carried and delivered through rejection. The call to Calvary to follow Jesus is a call to die and then rise again. It's a call to ever, everlasting next life gain through temporary this life loss. Let me read that again. It's a call to everlasting next life gain through temporary, this life, loss. Salvation isn't about securing our unique and selfish desires and ambitions on this earth, but about securing and preparing our souls for another world. A new creation built and preserved for our glory in God's and our satisfaction in Him. 
to truly live, we must surrender to the king we really needed, not the one we might have imagined for ourselves. Would you pray with me? Jesus, once again, we want to come to you and surrender to you whatever our imaginations would think you are. That we would instead surrender ourselves to your person that we see outlined in the pages of Scripture. That we would accept everything that you say. That we would not be like the disciples who, who want to force upon you some, some image that we have concocted or created. That instead we would recognize you to be exactly who you are. Our Savior. And that on top of that, Jesus, we would recognize that to follow you is exactly what you say it is. That it is not a quest for glory or honor, or, or worldly treasure, that it is not a, not a quest for earthly happiness and is an escape from all sorrow. No, instead that we would follow you as Paul write, that wrote, that we would somehow attain relationship with you in your death and then somehow, somehow through you attain the resurrection. And so, Jesus, all we can pray as we continue this journey through Holy Week with you is that you would continue to strip away, strip away the false things that are in our hearts, that cover our eyes, and that dumb our ears. And that we would begin to see the true Christ, the one who journeyed to Calvary with sure steps and with firm convictions, knowing that the glory of our salvation was worth every moment of anguish. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We'll talk to you tomorrow morning.